Wow, it's been a minute since I did the last one of these, but we're back on track now for this week's My Wednesday Comics. So this week was a bit of a scramble because the books I was looking for were sold out of the first store, so I had to run around to a couple of other comic book stores that were nearby, but everything worked out. And at the end of the day, I was thinking to myself, I can't complain because I have these stores, more than one store that are nearby, which is pretty great. So the books I wanted to highlight today are, first one is Star Wars Visions by the new superstar artist, Peach Momoko. Frank Miller's Ronin, book two, number five. This one is written and laid out by Frank Miller, and the artist is Philip Tan and Daniel Enriquez. And finally, this one I didn't know anything about. Um, It's called Animal Pound, and this is an ash can, and it's written by Tom King and Peter Gross is the artist. The comic book store owner of Invisible Jet Comics, Chris, handed it to me and she's like, hey, you should check this out. I know you like black and white comics. Um, So I was really excited to check out something totally new. Okay, let's take a look. All right, let's go. Peach Momoko, Star Wars Visions, the followers of Encock. Um, Peach Momoko is a rising star in mainstream comics. I first saw her do a bunch of different variant covers and Pretty much any time she does a variant cover for any of the books, any of the main um, Marvel books I've seen her do, uh, they sell out really fast. So she's a hot commodity. She's a young artist from Japan with a strong manga influence in her work, but she has her own spin on it, which is pretty cool. And you can see it in this book. Star Wars Visions, I believe is based off of a animated series that they put out where they got a bunch of different anime directors to try their take on Star Wars, which was really cool. Um, and so they're continuing that in the in, in comic book form, and Peach Momoko is not only drawing, but she's also writing this story. Uh, this first image is pretty interesting. I actually couldn't quite decipher what was going on i kind of see like a skull it's a little abstract but you'll notice in her work watercolors are a very strong component to her work the other thing you'll notice in this book is it's there's no dialogue um and so similar to gi joe silent interlude you've got to rely on the visual storytelling to tell you what's going on So it seems like there's the Sith Lord. They do give a little bit of backstory up at the front here. And then they describe four characters here. So that's all you get. She's a really great artist. And again, I think you see the manga influence, but her watercolor work kind of takes it over the top. And then she, and this one thing I noticed in the other work she's done, she did a series called Demon Days, which was a take on Marvel characters, but through ancient Japan and through her eyes. But one thing I noticed in those books is she has like a horror component to her work, which is really interesting. I know that's a big genre in Japanese comics. There's a lot of titles that are strictly Japanese horror. You don't see that that often or that successful in American comics, slowly more, but Definitely Japan, they have a whole genre of horror comics, and I think she must have been influenced by them. So, really great artwork here. Kind of cool with these rounded panels. Um, And then she'll bleed off the page here. But really striking images. She can can draw and paint, man. It's, uh, It's really great. I did get lost a little bit in the story. A lot of it seems like it's taking place in the abstract, mystical, Sith Force world. 
Um, so where that started and where it went back into reality was a little confusing to me, but nonetheless, you can see kind of the struggle in what happens here. This character is really cool, just kind of sitting there on the throne. Um, and then this, this little guy seems influenced by Maz Kanata from the uh, latest movies. The Sith gets disintegrated, and I believe this person here is like kind of their second in command or their, you know, not Padawan, but the second, like learning from the Sith Lord. So there's a lot of this like organic kind of Akira weird tendrils. Here comes the lightsaber. So yeah, I think actually part of the description at the beginning confused me because it was like, there's Sith. Let me read that again. Uh, like the main character, she's a descendant of the Sith and then hated the Ancock. But then the Ancock are like these evil people. So that's, I guess that's where I got a little bit confused. And maybe I don't know enough about the deep, deep Star Wars lore to totally track. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. Not only with the watercolors, it seems like she uses like graphite pencil here for some shading and dimension and really nice stuff. Her colors are not overly saturated. Definitely relies on watercolor and how that blends together. And then it looks like there's like a new, a new villain emerging at the very end. So yeah, these are all one shot stories. Um, the next one is coming out in January, I believe, of 2024 by Takashi Okazaki. And actually, he's the creator of Afro Samurai, the property Afro Samurai, which started off as a manga, got turned into an animated series, really incredible artwork. And he did a Visions book earlier in the year, I think. Um, I picked that up which was pretty awesome, but I guess they got him to do another one. So it looks like there's gonna, they're just a bunch of these one shots by manga or Japanese influence creators coming out by Star Wars Vision. So there you go, Peach Momoko. Keep an eye out on her work. The next book, I'm actually pretty surprised it's taken me so long to get to it because I've been collecting it since the beginning. This is issue number five. Uh, but this is Frank Miller's Ronin book two, number five. And Frank Miller is easily one of my favorite all time comic book creators. So recently within the last year or so, Frank Miller started his own imprint called Frank Miller presents and, uh, with Dan Didio, big editor in, in, uh, comics. And they started their own imprint. And uh, this Ronin book two is, is one of the main books he's been doing. So Frank Miller actually writes it, but he doesn't do all the art. He, ha he did uh, issue, I believe four or three, he did do the art, but he's just doing layouts. And then the artist Philip Tan and inker Daniel Enriquez are doing the artwork or the regular artists on this book. And it, when I first heard about the pairing up, of Philip Tan and Frank Miller, I thought, wow, that's going to be amazing. Um, and then as I was reading the book, I was like, huh, that's an interesting pairing. Philip Tan's an incredible artist. Frank Miller, obviously an incredible artist, but they're very, very different in the same route. Um, and so my reaction to the combo has been mixed. Um, I think Frank Miller is very, very strong with his storytelling through the layouts and the artwork. And so when he's not doing the actual art, seeing somebody take that Frank Miller isms and the things that he normally does and then dress it in their style and add their own two cents to it is interesting. And I think it's successful sometimes and not so successful other times. But there's no question that Philip Tan is 
pouring his heart and soul into this artwork and, and the inker as well um, because it's incredibly detailed and just complex and uh, yeah there's a lot of work put into it so this particular issue is awesome because it's basically double page spreads throughout the whole book we're kind of reaching the end of this story arc and uh, it's like this epic fantasy samurai cyber tale um, Ronin, since this is Ronin book two, it's actually a continuation of Ronin, his classic story, Ronin, which I really, really, really love. Some people didn't like it, but I loved it. This is Frank Miller's art. So this is the graphic novel of the first series. And I also have an artist edition, which is huge, um, of the black and white art that I believe it's the graffiti edition that DC put out um, of Ronin. And um, it's amazing. Maybe one of these days I'll do a flip through or talk about it because it's really incredible. Um, but anyway, it is a continuation of the story. And the story kind of goes off the rails a little bit, in my opinion. Uh, it's not as... For me, it's not as coherent as the first story was. And even the first story really pushed the limits of kind of what kind of story he was telling. And it, it, because the genres kind of mix and you can tell that when Frank Miller wrote the first Ronin, it's definitely influenced by like Lone Wolf and Cub and um, just these really epic, Japanese samurai tales and then he mixed in with it like futuristic sci-fi cyberpunk vibes similar to what he did a little bit in Dark Knight Returns but even more sci-fi so it's really cool and then it has this like fantasy kind of love story in it um, so it's really cool but it's it's held together because Frank Miller was writing and drawing that thing together but it's still cool, and I, I, I pick it up predominantly because the art, again, I love it that it's black and white. It really lives well in this black and white world. I don't think color would um, add you know, much to it. Not that it couldn't be colored well, but I really love the black and white presentation. And then they do a lot of this zip tone or digital zip tone which is a nice touch. Adds, adds another level to it where colors might help out instead they use gray tones they like to show frank miller's layouts a lot in the back of these books and one of the books he did the entire artwork and so you can see kind of how strong his layouts still are they're still reminiscent of like i'd say like sin city or dark knight returns to like they're reminiscent of that but you know, Frank Miller's getting older, and um, I think they wanted to try something new with Philip Tan. So, interesting combination. I'd say it's worth definitely worth picking up if you're a Frank Miller fan. And it looks like he might be drawing the last book, or and being inked by Enriquez. I'm not 100% sure. They keep moving around. So, I'd be curious to read interviews from Philip Tan about his experience because couple issues he dropped out Miller stepped in this last issue probably it looks like Miller's gonna finish it up I'm curious how he felt working with these layouts Miller's later work is a lot more graphic almost pared down um, and he started doing that in Sin City already but even more so and I, I figure it's you know he's a much older guy and he's his style is evolving with him I still love it I still think he's a strong strong visual teller and that shines through even in a limited fashion and philip tan is more like stylistic rending cross hatching so I, I, i'm curious to see how he felt what kind of freedom he felt or if he felt like he had to be really tight on frank miller's layouts i'd be really nervous because you know frank miller's a legend regardless of how old he is he's a legend so um anyway that's ronin book two number five now this last book is an ash can, and like I had mentioned earlier, 
um, the store owner, Chris, from Invisible Jet Comics, kind of brought it up and said, hey, you should check out this book. Um, because I know you like black and white art, and, uh, you know, it's an interesting book that just came out. So I love ash cans because they give you a little snippet of what a book could be. I love the format. Most ash cans are printed in black and white. Um, I actually was, before I heard about this book, one of the supplemental books I was thinking of reviewing was an ash can. So that'll come later, another episode. So anyway, I said, yeah, sure, I'll check it out. And um, <laughs> it's called Animal Pound. Tom King is the writer, Peter Gross, the artist, Tamara Bonvien, Bonvien? I don't know how to pronounce her last name, um, is the colorist, but in this ash can, it's black and white. So she just did the colors on the cover and I'm assuming the whole book, but it's called Animal Pound. And then with this image on the cover, I'm like, I asked Chris, I'm like, is this going to be sad? <laughs> is this going to be a bummer? And she's like, you'll see. So, um, you can only guess what this book is going to be like, but here we go. So again, presented in, in black and white, the first, I'm assuming like 10 pages this is, um, but it's this story that takes place in an animal pound and the writing is really good. It's, it's very heavy. This dog is kind of talking to this cat, Fifi. The dog's name is, oh man, I forgot what the dog's name is. But um, anyway, he's talking to this cat and kind of giving this, for lack of a better word, end of life conversation. Like he knows his life is about to be over and the cat's a, a pretty oblivious about it. The cool thing about the writing is they kind of play up what we naturally feel like are the personalities of dogs and cats where dogs are super loyal just there for their human owners and cats are totally oblivious to the world and just kind of there for themselves uh, I'm a cat owner I love both animals but I'm a cat owner so I can relate to that kind of stereotype so the dog is kind of giving this end of life speech to the cat of the role of cats and dogs and humans and and uh, how cats and dogs are actually equals and they're separated and segregated because of humans and having to serve what humans want out of these animals and yeah it's great we have a great life with humans but at the end of our lives they decide when our lives end it's really sad <laughs> really heavy um, but again, interesting. The artwork's cool. Peter Gross worked on, I think the, his last work was a book with Mark Millar uh, called American Jesus, which was turned into a Netflix series. I haven't seen, I haven't read the book or watched the series yet. I, I don't know much of his work, but just seeing it here, like he was observing a lot of cats and dogs and kind of referencing you know, different version of cats and dogs. I'm curious to see if he owns one or the other. This reminded me of the style of writing reminded me a lot of Animal Farm, which they're kind of trying to tell this Hume story about the pitfalls of humanity and where humanity can go through the eyes of animals. And, uh, sh and sure enough, as I read this kind of Summary at the back, um, Tom King is referencing a lot of Animal Farm, or basically Animal Pound is his reinventing of Animal Farm in the modern day, touching on some of those concepts and modernizing them a bit to what we deal with now. So if, if you haven't read Animal Farm, I highly recommend it. I actually have a really cool version of that. Let me find that in a second. Just a little impromptu. Um, this is the version that I grew up with. This is actually my childhood copy of Animal Farm by Ralph Steadman, who's one of my favorite caricature artists uh, in Animal Farm, written by George Orwell. This came out in... The original story was written in 1945. This version came out in 1995, so pretty old. But um, anyway... 
This is classic Animal Farm stuff here. Super awesome illustrations. Highly recommend this version of the story. Um, and it's, you know, the pigs are kind of a big deal in this story. But it's great. It's a great read. Classic story. And this story, Animal Pound, is kind of lives in that world. <laughs> this cute cat is not going to be cute much longer based on the story. So yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's cool if you like animals. Uh, I will probably look at the first issue when it comes out, the first full issue when it comes out and kind of see where it goes. It is kind of a bummer, <laughs> but it's cool to see where comics could go and the kind of stories you can tell. I'm always saying that. I said that about the European comics that I saw in Paris. The genres are so wide in other countries compared to America. So here, here we are in America trying to push the bounds and uh, tell a story in comics that don't have to be adventure or superhero, but are more human. Is it tough to swallow? Yeah, because like when you see animals getting killed and talking about death, it's, it's tough, but it, it's okay. So yeah, like I said, I'll probably pick up the first issue and look through it and see if it's a series I want to pick up. I'm not quite sure how long they're going to tell the story for, but interesting find. And I'm, I'm really um, happy that Chris pointed this out to me and that I could kind of explore it here today. These were actually not all the books that I picked up this week, uh, but the other ones that I didn't talk about in this episode were actually part of ongoing series that I have talked about in previous episodes. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to try and post some videos about them on as um, YouTube shorts to see how that works and just to try it out and see if that format works best for those kind of things where I'm not spending a long time talking about them, but just still showing and sharing what I picked up because they're still great books. I actually wasn't sure if I would be able to make another video for this week. I was a little behind because of my trip to Paris and kind of threw my schedule out of whack. But in the process of going to multiple stores, I really realized how great it was to interact with each one of the owners there, the shop owners and the people that work there, and just to talk shop, you know, just talk about what's the new books. Hey, do you have this book? Have you seen this one? And it just made me remember what it was, that initial joy that made me want to do this crazy channel to begin with. And it really inspired me to do it, to produce this week's video and to talk about it and I was excited to share about stuff that I wouldn't have normally picked up on my own. So I'm super motivated to try and figure out a way how to support these shops. I mentioned that a few episodes ago that that's something I wanted to do on this channel. So if you guys have ideas of how I can do it, some people have commented already. Um, I'm still brainstorming that. And I know a couple of the shop owners watch this. So if you guys have ideas of how you want to promote your shops, let me know. Um, because I really want to do that. I want to do a separate series that focuses on each shop and just the uniqueness of it. That's the one thing about comic book shops. They, and again, even though I was on in a different country, I felt that in each one of those shops, they each had a different vibe. They had a different flavor. They had a different feel. And that has a lot to do with the owners, that has a lot to do with um, the layout, that has a lot to do with what books they focus on, even how they display it. So it's really fascinating and it's so unique. It's it's a connecting thing. It's, it's um, water cooler talk and it's part of the joy of comic book collecting for me. Definitely subscribe and like and share this with your friends. I say those out of order every week <laughs> because the more eyes that we get on this channel, the more that we can kind of just continue the conversation. Oh yeah, and also I wanted to mention last Friday, I did my first live stream. You can watch that uh, on 
the live stream playlist, but it was really fun. And that real time interaction was great. And I appreciate all the people that showed up in the chat and were talking with me in the process. I'm definitely toying with the idea of reviewing Wednesday comics on a live stream. So that might be coming, stay tuned. Thanks to everybody who showed up. For those of you who didn't, all those guys got to be instant mods. So, you know, perks of being the first. Um, but I hope to do more live streams in the future, in the very near future. So keep an eye out and let me know if that's something you'd love to see. I'm always grateful again for you guys coming and watching and participating. And I will see you next week. <laughs>